means God with us. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift up, do not be afraid. Say to towns of Judah, Here is your God.
tomorrow. They have school, might be Tuesday, Wednesday this week, so we do have to completely reset the gym tonight, and we so appreciate your help with that. And then Wednesday night, our kids are going to be making gingerbread houses. If you brought donations, there was a list in the bulletin last week, I think it might still be there this week, to help them make gingerbread houses. That would be great. Uh, you can bring them tonight and give them to Miss Christie. I'm sure she would appreciate any donations that you could give to help out with that. That would be wonderful. And then next Sunday morning will be Christmas Eve, and we will just have one combined service at 1045. And Pastor Dave even had Amanda make up some lovely invitation sure. cards invite at least where you can invite more. some friends. Or more. Yeah. And if you think you want to invite more than two friends, stop by and pick up some more tickets. But you don't need tickets to come to church, but, you know, it would help them remember. So 1045, one service next Sunday on Christmas Eve. And then the following Sunday is New Year's Eve. And Pastor Dave and I want to extend an invitation to all of you to come to our home to for our annual um, open house Christmas party that we have after Christmas because we can't get it done before Christmas. So that will be a come and go from 4 to 7. And we will be running a shuttle. Somebody will be driving my car minutes. back and forth every 15 minutes. So you can park here and someone will come pick you up and shuttle you over to our house. And that way you don't have to worry about getting back and forth, but you can walk or you can park on the street. It's just that the street back here behind us is a, a narrow uh, little street with not a lot of parking, so it helps. We'll park at Eric's house. <laughs> yeah. no, park at Eric's house. Yeah, no, Eric lives down the road from us. So, so that would be great. We hope you will join us for that. And again, thank you for being here this morning. Would you all stand now and greet one another?
the Lord Jesus through this local church and any kind of donations you'd like to give during this time would be just wonderful. We would be glad to receive them from you. But I don't want you to hear that in the wrong manner, wrong spirit, because we mean it in the right way. But uh, so many times there are folks who are going through things and that's just one way to help them as well. Uh, last Sunday, going home from uh, church, when she got there, uh, Helen Agner uh, had smoke coming from her house. Uh, the person that she knows had called 911 and the trucks were coming and she is currently out of her house and I asked that you pray for her and she's here for now and going through some insurance uh, things there. So. There's more info we'll get to you as the time comes, but for now, I would ask that you would, um, if you have pets and they're around electrical cords, you may want to have them not near your electrical cords, because it very well may be, well, we might be talking about you the next time. We don't want to do that if we don't have to. And I told her, I said, you know, sometimes when bad things happen, God is always at work to create something good. Joseph in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, came out and said what others had meant for harm towards you, God used it for good. And many times when bad things happen to people who are committed to the will of God and to do His heart and His service, God will flip that around and He'll bless you every time. He'll take care of you. We don't look for destruction, but we do know when it does come, realize where your hope comes from. Your hope comes from God who created heaven and earth. Amen. And he'll take care of you this very day. Whatever you might be walking through this very day, God is there with you. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Um, gentlemen, folks, if you could come and help us this morning, we appreciate your time and your help. And today also I'd ask that you remember in prayer, Karen White has a sister named Patty who's in uh, the medical center right now. Um, under some potential stress or other things. She was at work, had pain in her chest, and uh, pray for Patty, if you would, as well, this very day. Amen. And while we bow today, I'd ask that you would think about the person to your left or to your right. They may be going through some difficulty this very day. Amen. Father, we bow before you and thank you for the privilege of being called your child. And today we ask that as we go through this Third Sunday of Advent, we pray that you would just hear our hearts cry and you will see our faithfulness and that you will test us and that we can be tried no matter how difficult the, how difficult the times may be towards us, that our confidence and hope is knowing that you alone will take care of our needs. And we thank you so much for you and who you are, Father, and thank you for the church of Jesus Christ that we're able to be a part of an incredible kingdom of God this way. Bless now the gift and the giver. Father, thank you so much for their faithfulness and their stewardship of putting you first in all things. Bless these needs also and the prayer request. And that's what's on our heart as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
offer you more is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted. To proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. And the garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Shout aloud and sing for, the jo for joy, people of Zion. For great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Today, we relight the candles of hope and peace. <coughs> now we light the candle for the third Sunday in Advent. This is a candle of joy. The three candles, going from expectation to peace to joy, represent our inner preparation, or inner perspective. In this world of conflict and division, greed, and lust for power, we begin this week with a sense of liberating joy. Perhaps we can pause, breathe deeply, and say, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Joy to
we stand in the presence of the Almighty God, the one that came as a babe in a manger, the one whose birth we celebrate this morning. But Father, you came not just to be born, but you came to die. And we're thankful, Father, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit that we feel in this service this morning. We pray, Father, that as you inundate this building and us, your people, that you will help us, Father, to open our hearts to hear your word, that we will worship you, that we will honor you with our lives and our gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Heaven and earth become one. That's what it's all about, isn't it? In a series I've been trying to work on here of recent days, I believe the Lord's given it to us, called The Journey. On The Journey, it talks about the promise of God, how He's taken us from where we are to where we need to be. And God is working all things out together for our good and for His glory. Amen? Amen. He's working it out. A lot of you have the journeys and steps and places you've been and things that you're not happy about and situations in your life that you wished, uh, if you had an opportunity, you could have taken them back, you would do that. Others of you are only hoping and dreaming and believing that there's something even better for you ahead, but you won't pay the price to get to that place. You're waiting for someone to hand it to you, and when God is just simply saying, trust Him, and yet, there's a fear that kind of rises up in a lot of people when those moments come. And then there's some of you who have actually come to a place in your life that even though there's fear among you and you look in your eyes and you feel it in your body and your bones quiver and shake, it's as if the psalmist has come and spoken to you in that 23rd division where it said, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And the whole premise of that part is that you're walking, not stopping. You're not dying. You're not quitting. In life, the victorious are the ones who go through the difficult places in their life, but still succeed, not because they're worthy or good enough, not because they're smart or wealthy enough, or have all of the right pieces in place. It all matters about one particular piece. As you have anticipation. In your spirit, you have anticipated the possibilities, but realization comes when you say yes to God through Christ Jesus by the power of His Holy Spirit. Amen? Think about that. You and I, we anticipate a lot. We look for a lot. We believe a lot. My early life when I was a younger person, <laughs> I was like 97 years ago, it feels like at times. I remember after graduating from high school, Anyone know the numbers of 1975? Uh, that was a long time ago. Any of you graduated in school, high school, prior to that? No, oh, prior to that. Bless your heart. <laughs> Any of you graduated college before that? Any graduated from college before then? How many of you at least 75 or older? No, I don't know. <laughs> My life has been built, and I, and I sadly say, but I'm thankful to God because it's been built around media. There are times growing up that my dad would talk to us and uh, he showed me a little book one day and I said, what is this book? He says, well, if you take it and you fold the upper right corner pages, it has pictures on it. I said, what do you mean? He says, here's one. It shows you uh, Tarzan. I said, well, but it has letters. I can, I can read the letters. I can read the book. He says, yeah, but if you take the corner of the upper right pages, does any of you know what I'm talking about? You can fan that and you see him running through the jungle and swinging on a vine. It, it was the coolest thing. And that was like the first introduction of what media was to me in a way that computers weren't even around. And then the TV came along and, of course, I grew up on the edge of night, it seems like, so to speak. <clears throat> Bad way to say it that way, but um, we moved from the... Have you ever seen black and white TV anywhere? Take your color out sometime. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. Oh, this is so cool. Get some popcorn and watch. We went from that, and I remember the color TV sets we had, and then we moved. Oh, we were uptown styling. 
I mean, we've got a good deal on it. My dad got this TV. It had solid state circuitry. You just pull the whole door out. If you ever had some kind of problem, you just pull the whole piece out. You didn't have to whole, take the whole TV to the store to get it repaired. Yeah, man, you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Nowadays, it's like a small little chip. It's an incredible about the intelligence that humanity has acquired that God, I believe, has laid it inside of all of us. We're all learners. And you look in the past of history and say folks like those disciples or the great people of the Bible, or you think of the people in the United States who were world changers, Benjamin Franklin, electricity, um, all these different types of folks, Thomas Edison. I thought how incredibly smart and talented they were. They were a part of a journey that God had a bigger picture for. And during their days, they were the heroes of their moment. I want to tell you today, you are on the verge of being a hero in your day. Will you trust God enough to allow Him to enlarge your vision, to enlarge your eyesight and what you see? Because if you cannot get past the word anticipation, you have already probably put a foot into the casket and said, I'm not going to do any more. I'm just going to sit and wait for someone to make it all happen. Then I'll just enjoy when I do so. God wants you to be a change agent in this world. I believe that. If not, then why do we have these college students sitting in front of us today who are going to places of higher education? Many of you have gone to college. Some of you haven't gone to college. We have Sierra down here. She's at Direct Nazarene University. Ooh. Doing a great job. Ooh. And so proud of her. Yeah. She and Macy is back in the back here. She's at Treveca. You don't even get to talk to each other up there. I know you stay busy. you got your own schedules. And then Garrett. Garrett, he's the smart one. I mean, I think these ladies are intelligent as all get out. But he just, you know, he was like a young high school or junior high person. He built his own 3D printer and made some plastic cup or he just, he's just smart. He's, he's got the smarts from this. Is that from your mama or your daddy? A little bit of both. Amen. Fair enough. Now, I say that question among our kids, and they just don't look at me. They just look at her. <laughs> look at me. They go, no, nah, he doesn't know any better. Forgive him. Well, during those days of the media and all the time of things changing, think about it. When stuff was going on in your life as you're coming up, there are changes going on that you don't understand. And there are times when you're trying to process it, you're trying to have that solid state circuitry move from the radio or vacuum type tubes into solid state up to some Pentium chip that you're able to process from generation to the next decade and so on. The story I want to share with you today primarily is taken out of Matthew chapter 1. And if you want to leave your Bible open, that would be fine. There's a couple of places in your worship folder you want to look at some of these verses. But the primary one will be out of verses 18 through 25. And just leave it open because I'm going to close with that in just, hopefully just in a few minutes if, if the Lord allows it. During this time of learning and how things change, if you would bear with me, some of you have never seen this because you're too young. But I want to show in a moment about the word anticipation, I can't get away from Carly Simon's voice this entire week. I've been praying, Lord, how do I share the good news with our folks and tell them about the anticipation? I mean, to come to a place where we hear about the shepherds and, the, and then later the wise men, they come and find Jesus in a house, a place different than the birthplace where the shepherds were. How do we understand the word anticipation today? Well, you may or may not like this, and it may be offensive to you, and, and I'm sorry if it is, but it's something, if, if I can get you to remember the word anticipation, Andrea's going to help me with a commercial from 1978 that I couldn't seem to get away from. Watch this. It's about 30 seconds long. Listen. Good morning, you catch up slow. You mean your mom doesn't buy your Amen. Those are the good.
good old days, amen? Those were the wonderful color machines, color TVs, and so on. It was just a fabulous thing to have. And I'm thankful God has allowed me to make it to this point in my life as well, aren't you? Amen? Aren't you happy you're where you are today? And knowing that God has potential inside of you, amen? Would you just say that with me? God has potential for my life. God has potential for my life. And I am anticipating, and I am anticipating His, possibilities His possibilities in me. In me. Amen. amen. I said, oh, thank you. Okay, you stop here. <laughs> Thank you for listening and obeying. You did so good. Now if you just listen to Susie, that would be good. Amen. Why is it so important that you and I know why Jesus Christ came to the earth? Why is that so significant? Why is it important that the Word of God would be so listed before us that we can understand what Christmas is about? The very word Christmas, Mass of Christ, the time where even the song Silent Night came into existence because a person was supposed to write a cantata and they had a problem and a man went out and penned the words and came in and played it immediately, started singing Silent Night, Holy Night. You see, when you put your trust and hope in God, He will give you time to do things even on the spur of the moment if it need be. I think it's His purpose. He wants us to be that way and live our life on the spur of the moment. The disciples were with Jesus Christ one day, and they heard these stories, I'm sure, of Him telling about how He grew up. The question I have is, did Jesus have a Christmas tree? Did Jesus, did He have presents that they gave? That's a modern technologi uh, technological type of advancement I think that a lot of us have grown up being a part of. And we have accepted it as gospel, so to speak, when in fact, it really doesn't connect to the gospel, if you think about it. Actually, there are actually pagan groups who have come up with a lot of different areas about the Christmas tree. But God has never run away from what the pagans have done. Even in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 17, when Elijah stood against the prophets of Baal and the Ashtaroth poles that were there, during those days, there were 450 prophets in each of those camps that were saying that they had the answer. And the peer pressure of the moment was incredible. And here's Elijah standing all by himself saying, Okay, God, what do I do now? What he was saying is, I'm anticipating that you're not going to leave me. You're not going to fail me. You're not going to forsake me. That you're going to stay with me during this moment. And Elijah made the comment just real quickly, the God who answers by fire will be the one that we will serve. And the short of the story is this. He built an altar in the sense that he was honoring and worshiping God. And he poured water on it, if you will. He was baptizing that altar and had rocks around it. And that was his church because I grew up being a blockhead during the days of Charlie Brown too. Amen. And we're all a bunch of blockheads. Maybe that's what we are. But God said through Jesus that even the rocks would cry out if his own people didn't. And I think I'm a little better than a rock, don't you? Well, you're wondering, what's that have to do with Christmas? Well, it has to do because the whole premise of humanity is trusting in God. That day, the sacrifice happened, and Elijah was anticipating the power of God to come upon him, and it did. And the fire of heaven came down from God, and it swallowed up every bit of that altar, sacrifice, water, hundreds of gallons, and all the rocks that were there contained. Those prophets lost their life that day. The one thing that's missing in the church of Jesus Christ today, I contended with my last breath. We're afraid. We lack courage to be the church that God calls us to be. Man, he's not even talking about Mary and Joseph anymore. We can't even share during the Christmas season adequately until we overcome our fear of hurting someone's feelings and not being politically correct. Excuse me. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm trying to say? I don't know. You're probably saying, I don't know what you're saying. Okay. God gave us Jesus 
so that we wouldn't have to be afraid. Amen. God gave us Jesus that we can let our light shine and they will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. God gave us Jesus so we could have a better way of anticipating His next blessing. God doesn't want you and I to be fearful of what the world has to say. You have no reason. We have no purpose. I can understand of why to be afraid in this world. Oh, I'm not saying not being cautious. I'm not saying we don't have fear in our life because God gave us that mechanism of fear inside of us as well. I've had fear, moments of fear in my life. I've had times I've been scared even as a Christian. And God has helped me every day of my life. I like Christmas trees. They're just trees. They don't become Christmas and think until you put ornaments on them. That's what I was told. We used to have Christmas trees in every room of our house. Praise God. He answers prayer. We don't have it in Oh, excuse me, my wife's turning the floor. <laughs> One room that I can think of this so far. Oh no, it may change before the night's over. Who knows? My wife loves Christmas. So do I. But there was a time, even as a Christian, I struggled with Christmas. I'm being honest before you. Because it's stressful. It's tiring. You just go all the time. And now my wife makes fun of me because I'm watching Christmas shows on Hallmark before Thanksgiving comes in. <laughs> I want you to know this. You can anticipate the blessing of God in your life this very day. God has you on a journey. And He doesn't want you to be afraid. Realize this. The very word, what God is trying to help us to see through Jesus coming, we sung about it earlier, Emmanuel. Meaning God with us. Uh, do you know that God is in our world? Do you realize that? Amen? He's in the world today. He's in our church and He's in our life. Let me just touch briefly on the world. Within the world, during this day of understanding, no computerization, no electricity, no running plumbing, so to speak, Joseph is having a struggle in chapter 1 of Matthew because he loves God. He keeps the law. He keeps his horse under 55. He doesn't race it any faster because that's what the law says. He doesn't walk further than a half a mile each Sunday, Lord's Day, because that's what the law says for him to do. He keeps all the 608 laws that they have, one for every day and other type of laws too. He's kept those. He's been faithful to God. And now he's just been told by the love of his life, um, I'm pregnant. He comes up to her and says, What you talking about, Mary? <laughs> he goes to sleep. And during his time of sleep, the Lord knows his heart. You know, the Lord knows our hearts as well. Yeah. And he talks to us a lot during our time of sleep because it seems like during the other uh, 23 hours of the day while we're awake doing things to please ourselves or please other people, we're not hearing what he has to tell us. So Joseph is asleep, the Bible says, and while he's sleeping, there's something powerful happening. The angel comes and tells him in verse 20 and says, Mary will give birth to a son. She's a virgin. And not to go into any detail because of any younger folks in here, maybe, uh, you can talk to your child when you get home about that, moms and dads. It's okay. The church doesn't have to raise your children on everything. But if you'd like to know more, come talk to me. I'll be glad to share the thoughts with you. Or I can show you pictures of my children, our children. And Joseph is struggling, I think, in his dream when the angel says, and it's taken off from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where the prophet Isaiah was told and shared the thoughts. There's a struggle in Isaiah chapter 7. It's great. You should read that. It's an incredible passage, Isaiah chapter 7. 
But Isaiah stands and he talks about and says, how long will you mock God? How long with the, the example of your life are you going to put him off and do what you think by pleasing all these other gods in society? He says in verse 14 then in Isaiah 7, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And he will save, his name will be Emmanuel and he will save his people from their sin. Now then you jump over into the future hundreds of years and you come to Joseph. He's in a dream and now he's hearing his angel talking to him. And in his world, it's falling apart. He wants to marry this love of his life. But he can't. Because the law says, if someone is betrothed to you during that betrothal promise, the engagement, the giving of a ring to show to other people that she's mine, hands off, bucko. <laughs> Don't come near her. Don't even smile wrong, but I'll think of the wrong thing, okay? And in Jesus' name, I'll explain it to you. <laughs> didn't have to do that. He was struggling with what people were saying. He was dealing with the law and what others were thinking because... What am I supposed to say? You ever thought about that? How important you really are? That, that, that you really care what other people think about the love of your life? You know, the one who matters most to me, I love every one of you. I don't know, I hope, I hope you hear me right on this. That your opinions are not as important as hers in my life. And I'm going to do everything I can to bless her and lift her up and love her. I'm going to love you, but I can't bow before you. Am I in trouble already? Amen. Okay. And neither should you do the same to your spouse, man, if you're married. You need to lift them up. And if they make a wrong decision or something, you see, we have this custom, it seems like. Men have been trained by their fathers and the fathers have, by their grandfathers and their grandfathers by their fathers have taught this, that men don't cry in society, that men, uh, they're the ruler of the house, and when you're married, the woman listens to you because it's to love, honor, and obey. My wife says, pick up your socks, and I go, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and if we'd have had that listed in our wedding vows, she'd say, can we have a time out here? We need to work this out. But we didn't have that in our vows. Joseph is going through something very similar to the place where in his world around him is dictating how he's supposed to respond. He has the right by the law to go and stone his betrothed bride. That he could have her put to death so that he will not be embarrassed. She is not going to listen to who I am. She's been with somebody else. And God would not let it go. He knew that Joseph was having struggle. So God sent an angel. In your time of need, you don't worship the angel. You worship Almighty God. Because the angel is just a messenger. A messenger of help and of hope for each of one of us. The angel of the Lord comes to assist you and me during our time of need. And when you feel like the whole world is on top of your shoulders and you can't stand, you can't even get yourself off of the ground, you can't like put your body in to drive, you're just stuck in park, or you're in reverse and you're always backing up and life is just not working for you, call upon the name of the Lord. He will send His angel at the right time and He will hold you and He will lift you up and He'll help get the debris off of you if you'll keep your trust in God. Amen. Joseph was struggling. And in the dream, he had a decision to make whether he was going to trust God or trust what the law said. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The law is important. The law is there to protect us. That's why the Ten Commandments were given by God in the law. They had two purposes. To provide for our needs and to protect us. Check them out. Go to Exodus 20. You can learn all about them right there. Not necessarily right now. In the dream, the angel said, she will give birth to a son, and you, verse 21, you will give him the name Jesus. And I have read that I, I, hundreds of times. I've quoted that verse possibly hundreds of times. 
And it never stood out to me more than this morning, as we sung even the last song, Heaven and Earth Became One. You know what it means? In your world today, God is trying to unite with you. He's wanting you to not be fearful. He doesn't want what we typically feel like we need to do, is that we as the church, we as the Christians, we think it's our God-given right to come and nitpick and belittle and put down. Because it makes us look good, it makes others look bad. That's not what the kingdom of God is all about, is it? It's not that at all. He sent Jesus to us not to judge, but to show us how to love other people. We have become the righteousness of God when we put our hope and trust in Jesus Christ. And the only help we have in saving this society through the will of God is that if the church will not commit and consecrate and allow God to set you apart and sanctify you holy. Your lives and your family are going to continue to be ripped apart. Our world needs a, a life of consecration to the will of God. And that's where our struggles are at. Because people don't want to be told, especially what they can't see, to trust God. And I believe a lot of times God has simply given us dreams and we're ignoring them, thinking it's just... Maybe we had too much pizza the night before. In the world, Emmanuel is in our world. And he was in the world with Joseph. And Joseph had to make a decision. The, the Emmanuel is in our church. There's a story I found about a man named Huxley who was a person down in Australia. And he had this vest. He, he wanted to prove a point that man could do the impossible. And the best I understand, he was the first one who committed to doing this. And his life, as he was doing this, he had this vest. And he had about a 15 meter or 45 foot cable attached to his vest. And on the other side was the shaft of the front of the nose of a 747 jetliner. And he had it attached to that. And he's on this runway. And he believed... He could do anything. He believed he was strong enough. And he did all the angle and the bending, all he could do. All of a sudden, in 88 seconds, he was able to pull that 747, almost the length of a football field, just about two feet short, as the news had told him. Incredible feat. You see, that jet ladder resembles the church. There's a few people in the world who can do extraordinary things. But the reality of life is that the church is not built off of a few people, especially in the church. Church doesn't dictate off of the pastor or a few people in the church who make things happen. Our church needs to be governed by all the hearts of volunteers. Every one of us are part of the family. We all do things. For example, when our children come home, my wife doesn't do, although she does a lot, she doesn't do everything. She gives them responsibilities. Even has our grandchildren who are participating. She's making chocolate chip cookies. You know what they talk about when they're with other people about Christmas time? Oh, I remember the Nana. She let me get messy and I had flour all over me. And we rolled up the batter and flattened them out and we cut them and what we needed to do. And we greased the cookie sheet and we turned the oven on. And we make these chocolate chip cookies and you bite into them and the chocolate would just drip onto your lips. Oh, it was so good. You know, they don't remember all the toys that they had under a tree or something. In their life, their family, even our children and our grandchildren, they remember the moments of memories that we had with us as a family. You see, we have a church here, but God was within our church at home as well. Because your home is like a small group of people, of believers, who put their trust and hope in God. You are like a church at your home. Dad, you need to be the pastor of your home. You need to spiritually lead your home. Don't wait for the wife to say, let's pray. You take the lead. Be the leader. And don't be so demanding. And if there's not a dad or a man in the family there, then ladies... It falls next to you. You become head over your family. Teach your children in the ways of the Lord. 
God is trusting in you to anticipate His goodness and blessings. He wants to be with you. And just like that jetliner, there's a few of you who can get it done. But the reality is, I'd rather pray and let the Holy Spirit of God fall upon me fresh and new again. The Bible says over in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, it says God has put all things under the authority of Christ, and He gave Him this authority for the benefit of the church. And the church is His body, and is filled by Christ, who fills everything everywhere with His presence. What is He saying? It's like the song that April sings, that we are His body. But why aren't His hands reaching? Why are we not doing what needs to be done as the body of Christ? Ow! <laughs> That's what He's trying to help us to see. He's with us in the world, He's with us in our church, and He's with us in our life. You know what happened with Joseph? Joseph came to a place in his life that he felt like he felt like he needed to make that decision. You know what his decision was? His decision was to put his trust in God, no matter what other people said. And what happened was this. We sung about the song. God sent Jesus Christ to be salvation for the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that no one... Do you remember the rest of that? That everyone who puts their hope in Him... Yeah, it says some of those words too. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him would not perish. Why would He say that? Because, you know, when God comes and saves us, we have this feeling... That we can go out and live like the devil and God's still going to forgive us. And I wish to God that's the way it was. But it isn't. We're accountable, my friends. We will be held accountable before God. You can't say you're a part of the church and the kingdom of God and live a life that's in rebellion against the will of God. We will die in our sin if that's what we choose to do. But aren't you grateful? that He sent Jesus. Because Jesus became that salvation, not that He wants anyone to perish, but you read the next verse, it says that He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through Him. What He's saying is this. Eternal, eternity, heaven and earth, God wants you to become one. In John 17, Jesus prayed that, that prayer that said, he wanted heaven and earth, the thing of God, the will of God, the love of God, the heart of God, and humanity to become one. That's what he wants. He wants that for today. Joseph, when you get to that verse 20 or whatever it was in your passage of Matthew 1, it says this, and when Joseph woke up. The King James says something when he had risen from his, his sleep. But the NIV and most other versions say, when Joseph woke up. And it stood out to me as a tall building off of my pages of the Bible. When you and I wake up and quit worrying what other people are thinking and we live the life that we just live to please God. We rejoice in God our Savior. We worship Him. And worship, and wherever we are, away from the church as well. And the Bible says at the very end that it comes again from Isaiah 7, 14. And when they ask, when Jesus was born, what are you going to name Him? Well, Mary wanted to say, and did say, His name will be Jesus. But the authority came from the Father. See, Joseph was not the biological father. The Holy Spirit of God was. How do you explain that to someone? How do you and I, after a couple thousand years, how do we explain that to people in the world who don't even understand it? I thank God I don't have to worry about that. He can explain it to someone's heart a lot easier than I can. But I do know this. When Joseph woke up from his dream... 
They said, what are you going to name the child? He said, his name will be Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. What do you believe this Christmas? Is it about Santa? Is it about the toys? I hope not. I pray not. Is it about pleasing other people? You've got to go to 19 different things on a day before Sunday. We had a busy day ourselves yesterday. I understand what you're talking about. But there's no other place my wife and I would rather be than right here with God's people. Amen. Amen. We want to be with you on this day of worship. I'd like to invite you to stand with me and ask you to ponder these thoughts. Is God first in everything in your life? Does He have the clear right of way in every area in your life? Will you worship Him without hesitation? Will you put Him first no matter what anyone else says? Or will you be a person that's concerned about, well, I can't do this because I don't want to hurt their feelings. Honey, it's not that you intentionally hurt their feelings. It's that you're loving God above everyone else. It's not trying to find the weakest way to make it happen. It's taking the strong front and being Christ-like in front of the world. The people that you're, you think you're not, you're maybe possibly hurting, you're not hurting them. You're avoiding pleasing God. And God wants you to please Him with all that's in you today. Amen. I want you to sing this closing song with me. If you need to make a heart commitment to Him, do it right where you are. If you need to come and pray at an altar, come do that. But today I don't want you to leave without realizing that you can anticipate the blessings of God if you'll trust Him with all of your heart. For without trusting Him with all of your heart, you're going to miss a lot of blessings that He wants to share with you through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, come let us